afternoon. My name is Abby. I'm part of the environmental preparatory team. Hi, how are you? I'm Miss Pascal. Good. I'm so glad you decided to attend today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course. Um, so just a little bit about us. Um, I'm part of the environmental preparatory team from Stanley County Schools. My team, because there are a few of us, um, I'm just here today to talk to you because I know we have a very small class today. Um, but we travel to different school systems to provide awareness on albinism and how to address deficits in his or her learning. Okay, great. I'm here to take notes so I can better help my children. Perfect. Okay, so what is albinism? Um, albinism is an inherited condition that leads to someone having very light skin, hair, and eyes. These individuals have less melanin than usual, than usual in their body, and then melanin gives skin, hair, and eyes their color. Um, I have a video that we're gonna watch really quick that just gives you like a little bit about it. Okay, great video. I've heard about albinism. Albinism is a rare genetic condition where a person's body isn't able to make skin color. But what exactly is albinism and how? I'm sorry, Ms. Pasco. What were you saying? I've heard about albinism, but I don't really know exactly what's involved or, you know, the type of deficits that a child would have with albinism. Okay, perfect. Well, today we're going to learn all about it. And if you have any questions after this, then I will address them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is it? <laughs> here for D News. Albinism is a genetic condition where a person's body isn't able to make pigment, so people with this condition have white skin and hair with light blue or pink eyes. Albinism is a complex disorder. You get your skin, eye, and hair color from melanin, which is distributed through a number of genes, but if one of these genes carry a certain mutation, the amount of melanin that is distributed through your body changes, where sometimes this mutation will keep your body from producing any melanin at all. Melanin is produced by cells called melanocytes, which are mostly found in your skin and eyes, but also in your hair. People with darker skin have a higher concentration of melanin in their skin as opposed to fair-skinned people. Albinism is the absence of melanin completely, and it's not just people, any animal with pigment can be albino too. Albinism is passed down genetically. In most cases, there is someone else in the family who has the condition, but not all cases are the same. There are actually many types of albinism that all affect a different gene mutation. Oculocutaneous albinism, which is when it affects your eyes, skin, and hair, ranges from type 1 to type 4 with varying degrees of melanin impact and affects 1 in every 20,000 people. The most severe form of albinism is oculocutaneous albinism type 1 or OCA1. OCA1 is caused by a mutation in one of four genes. It's characterized by having pink or white skin, eyes, and hair. Some babies born with OCA type 1 do develop slight pigmentation during their early childhood, but many born with this type of albinism never do. OCA type 2 is less severe than type 1. Skin and eye color will be pale, but hair color is more likely to be red, yellow, or auburn. OCA type 3 mostly affects people who are darker skinned and will create a reddish light tan tone with auburn eyes. OCA type 4 is very related to type 2. It's hard to diagnose which type of albinism is at work and is best left to genetic testing. Another type of albinism is ocular albinism type 1, OA1, also called Nell Ship Fall Syndrome. Much like its name suggests, only the eyes are affected by the genetic mutation while hair and skin will remain the same. This happens only when the genetic mutation of an X chromosome is inherited, so it occurs mostly in males. The eyes will appear bluish pink. The iris is super translucent, and the most important part of the eye, the fovea, which is responsible for a sharp image, does not develop properly. However, any degree of albinism comes with vision problems, which include being cross-eyed, being sensitive to light, and rapid eye movement and functional blindness. An estimated 1 in 20,000 people worldwide are born with it, and it affects about 20,000 people in the U.S. every year. OCA type 2 happens more frequently in African Americans, Native Americans, and in Sub-Saharan Africa. Nigeria is one of the highest prevalences of albinism in the world, with over 2 million people affected. There are many myths that surround albinism and why it happens. While it's true that people with albinism can't tan and many do get very serious sunburns, the chances of getting skin cancer is just as high with anyone else who spends a lot of time in the sun. Other myths include the belief that albinos possess magical traits or bring about bad luck. Some tribal communities in Africa persecute them, forcing them to leave their native communities or be killed. Places like Tanzania are having an especially hard time controlling this myth, where sacrifices and the belief that albino body parts bring good luck causes a spike in albino hunting. So, do you have albinism? Know anyone who has it? Tell us your story down in the comments below. Keep coming back here to D News. We've got new episodes. Okay, so. Wow. Okay. That was a lot to take in, but that was very informative video. Thank you for providing that. You're welcome. And also, I'm going to break it down just a little bit for 
further try to take out the pieces that matter the most. Um, so albinism um, is something that's not really heavily talked about, especially in the school system. Um, so that's why today we've just voted um, this session to really focusing on albinism and then like the visual deficits that go along with it. Um, also, if you have time later, you can check out another video that's provided that also gives you a little bit more on albinism just to um, kind of bring this Yeah, and I'll give you my school email so that way you can go ahead and send me that link. Yeah. So it will this entire presentation that you have so that way I can have the facts. Okay. Um, can we get that? Yes, at the end of the okay. session. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Thank you. Uh-huh. Okay. So just to break it down just a tiny bit further, um, find my buttons. Okay. So different visual deficits within albinism. So photophobia was something that was briefly talked about in the video, um, which just means that they are super sensitive to light. Um, so it's just like maybe um, someone who has photophobia might wear sunglasses more often. It's because they have less pigmentation in their eyes, um, so it just makes it harder for them to receive light. Uh, nystagmus. Nystagmus is a vision condition in which the eyes make repetitive, uncontrolled movements. These movements often result in reduced vision and depth perception and can affect balance and coordination. These involuntary eye movements can occur from side to side, up and down, or in a circular pattern. Um, Short-sightedness and long-sightedness. Long-sightedness, also known as hyperopia, is a common eye condition that can be hard to detect. It makes close objects appear blurry or you might be able to focus clearly but get tired eyes or headaches. Short-sightedness myopia is a very common eye condition where you cannot see objects far away clearly. Uh, these are much common, more common in people, just everybody, um, but outside of albinism. So here are some videos just to put it in perspective. What is photophobia? Something heartwarming happened when the cat. What is photophobia? I know it smells like it should be a fear of the light, right? Well, it actually refers to light sensitivity. I have photophobia because I have albinism, and that means I don't have the amount of pigment in my iris that I'm supposed to that helps to protect my eyes from the sun and other light sources. Photophobia, like many eye conditions, is pretty varied and can even vary day to day for the same person. So I might be having a great light day to day and can handle more sunlight and more bright lights, but say yesterday, I was not having a very good day likewise, and I woke up my eyes were already sore and sensitive to the light. Photophobia can also cause physical pain. And even for those of you who don't have light sensitivity, the sun can damage your vision. So don't forget, use sun protection. Like and follow for more. Okay, so that's just a little on photophobia. Um, this explains far and nearsightedness. Welcome to Moon and Math and Science. In this video, let's talk about the difference between nearsightedness and farsightedness. Nearsightedness, also called myopia, is when people can see nearby objects clearly. However, objects that are far away appear blurry and not in focus. Nearsightedness may be caused by an eyeball that is too long or a cornea that is curved steeply. As a result, as light passes through the lens, the image comes into focus at a point in front of the retina. This results in a blurry image. To correct nearsightedness, a person can wear glasses with concave lenses Concave lens, also called a diverging lens, is a lens that is thicker at the edges than in the center. Since the nature of the problem of nearsightedness is that the light is focused in front of the retina, a diverging lens, which a concave lens is, will serve to diverge the light before it reaches the eye. The light will then be converged by the lens, which is convex, to produce an image on the retina. Farsightedness, also called hyperopia, is when people can see distance objects clearly. However, objects up close are blurry. This may be caused by people with eyes that are too short or a flat cornea. The lens of the eyes bends the light from nearby objects so that the image does not focus properly on the retina, but instead is focused beyond the retina. 
If light could pass through the retina, the image would come into focus at a point behind the retina. Convex lenses are used to correct farsightedness. Convex lens is thicker in the middle than the edges. A convex lens makes the light rays bend towards one another. Before they reach the eye, then the lens of the eye bends the rays even more, which causes the light to strike the retina and the image will be in focus. Thanks for watching. I hope this helped. The okay, so obviously you're not diagnosing anybody. Um, you're not going to know, hey, you need glasses. Right. Um, it's just a video to let you know if this is what it looks like, the far side of course. Right. I, I don't have albinism, but of course I feel like I'm self diagnosing myself with myopia. You know, I wear <laughs> glasses, so okay. Okay, this last video is on the sadness. Why do my eyes shake? In all my comments, this is my most frequently asked question. So here's the answer. Oh, well, he's diagnosed. Mine is involuntary, so I can't control it. I can't see it and I can't feel it. It's one of the many eye conditions that contribute to my blindness. A lot of people ask if I see blurry because of it. No, because I'm blind and because my usable vision has always been the same, so I have nothing to compare it to. There are surgeries to alleviate it, but I don't want it because one, it wouldn't cure my blindness, so it doesn't really have a huge effect on my life. And I also don't really care. It's more bothersome for the people around me than it is for me, which tells you a lot about the world we live in. I hope this helped. Why do my eyes shake? Okay. In all my comments, this so, is so in um, some cases, people that have albinism, they are blind, um, but for this session specifically, we're just going to discuss things um, that are people who have visual deficits, not necessarily completely visual deficits. Um, <clears throat> however, if you would like more information on it, please come to me after the session and we can discuss it. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about your classroom. What does your classroom look like? So tell me about what your walls look like. Do you have windows, bright lights, lamps? So my classroom has pretty much one way in, one way out. We have one door. Um, it's maybe about half the size of the room that we're in now. Um, we have light colored walls. I, I have two windows. I have one window on the right side and one window on the left side, but they're both in the front and the back. Um, we actually do have little lamps that we kind of use to make like tone down the light sometimes and like use lamps because of the sunlight, so much sun that's coming into the classroom. Mm -hmm. Um, we do have a whiteboard. However, we also have, um, a, like a, it's a board that looks like a screen. Okay. So you write on the right. screen? Right. Yeah. We can write on the screen. We can actually type on the screen okay. and we also write on the whiteboard as well. Okay, so it's kind of like this and then you also have like a whiteboard yes. too. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, do you use both of them? Which one do you use the most? I typically use the whiteboard most because I'm old school. Uh -huh. So I just believe in, you know, kind of writing everything out, you know, that way the children can have a chance to come up and write things out behind me. So it just helps, you know. Okay, um, so if you don't mind me asking, as of right now, like, what do you think, without my advice, like, what do you do right now to prep for testing? Like, how do you make sure your kids are well equipped for testing? Um, well, we do like little study guides, and I ask them questions, and I let them know, you know, a couple days ahead of time, you know, hey, are you preparing for this? Mm -hmm. you know, this is something to make sure that you go home and, you know, study. Um, I make sure they have supplies needed, so I bring in extra things that may be needed, such as like pencils, paper for note taking. Um, I make sure that um, that my room, my door to my classroom is always closed, you know, mm -hmm. just to kind of lessen some of those distractions. Okay. Yeah. That sounds great. Um, so for people that have more visual deficits, I just made a list of some things that might be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, if you do have someone who has albinism or other visual deficits. Um, so you could make things like higher contrast. So let's say you're white, writing on your whiteboard instead of using like a very pale faint color like paint, um, you should use black. Um, and then when it comes time to like, maybe you're using your, um, this board, right? So instead of using like colors like pink and highlighting in yellow, 
you would make it your font black and then um, highlight in yellow or make it bold so they can see it. So like you'll have bigger fonts or have contrast just so that people who do have visual deficits can see it a little better. Um, and then in some cases, due to photophobia, you may want to reduce light. Um, so it's a good thing you have the lamps. I think they'd yeah. be super helpful, mm -hmm. um, especially if you were going to reduce light on some days for, for that. Um, because sometimes, you know, with the children, they're kind of like really excited, especially like when we're coming back in from the playground area. Mm -hmm. And so I decided, okay, we're going to you know, dim the lights and turn our lamps on. And we also have blinds in our classrooms. Mm -hmm. So I'm still able to like, you know, shut the blinds, close them, and just kind of have like a, all right, let's settle down. Everybody right. take like a little quick 10 minute break, you know, just kind of loosen up, get all those wiggles out, and like, let's get back focused for, you know, the content that I'm about to teach. I think it's awesome that you're also working on mindfulness, which is uh, something for another day. Yeah. But, um, but yeah. these are great examples for, you know, if I ever come in contact with a child, which I'm sure I will in the future, um, or with the, you know, visual deficit. Right, right. Um, and then also just to be more being uh, closer to the board. So if you notice someone's like squinting and they can't mm -hmm. really see, um, or maybe they're just not as like actively participating as other kids, you could have them come closer, um, change up your classroom a little bit. I'm not sure if you use tables or if you use little desks, but you could also like change the layout of the kids mm -hmm. um, just to make it more conducive um, to where like they're learning the most. And then um, if they need to get longer amounts of time for notes, because I know sometimes like kids will take forever to take notes, and of course you erase and you don't even think about it because you have so much to cover. Um, but just allow just a little bit more time if they need it. Um, just some adaptations and modifications. Uh, for example, you could use low tech classroom accommodations such as magnifiers, light adjustment with the lamps, and. Um, larger print like we discussed. Um, additionally, also changing the seating, um, giving optimal time for note taking, and then, you know, not having over excessive lighting for classroom. You don't want to be too bright. And we also have a few magnifiers in the classroom because when we do go outside, like during the summertime, sometimes we, um, uh, well, when it gets hot, we go outside and find certain insects and so we use the magnifiers to actually look inside to you know see those little um, like butterflies and stuff growing so it's pretty cool but to know that i can also use magnifiers for a child that has visual uh, deficits it's amazing too right right dual purpose uh, okay so here is an activity and we're kind of wrapping it up at this point okay. but um so we have arnold who's an eight-year-old third grader that has oculocutaneous albinism uh from what we've discussed with prior teachers he doesn't talk much to other children and he typically sits in the back of the class you notice that he sits far from the window and doesn't always complete assignments in class he frequently asks to leave the content learned from class on the board to finish taking his notes uh, with the given case scenario and the information provided to you today, how would you respond as the student's educator? Um, well, I would definitely take into what you had told me about the visual, um, just kind of going back to look at some of the examples. Um, I would also ask the student, like, hey, you know, is something going on? You know, is it something we need to talk about? Mm -hmm. Is it something that um, you're having trouble with, you know, when I'm going over? lecture or what to have you um i could also get in touch with this uh, you know caregiver or guardian to kind of see some things that may be happening in the home mm -hmm. just to kind of touch bases to make sure that maybe you know something that i'm doing in class uh, or as far as like when it comes to homework mm -hmm. or is, is this child maybe struggling to um you know look at some things the content for homework um Um, I could also possibly talk to some of the interdisciplinary team, such as like uh, maybe guidance counselors. We have some, some therapists that come in and see some other children. We have like OT, we have speech. Um, we have a couple of different people that come. So I can also just kind of network within the team to see what other you know insights I may be able to gather from them. Because uh, when I tell them something that this child is actually doing in class, um, but first, again, you know, just kind of have a discussion with him 
with Arnold to see like, hey, you know, what's going on? I'm kind of noticing this within the classroom. There's something I can help with, mm -hmm. you know, and also definitely, you know, reach home, you know, send an email or letter home to parents to ask like, hey, this is something I'm noticing within the classroom. Right. Um, is there something that, you know, is happening at home when it comes to like, is he completing homework and things of that nature? So, or is he just having those challenges? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, also though, just because of what we know about albinism, mm -hmm. um, I would, I would do think maybe we should move Norman closer to the front, and especially since he doesn't, I think he sits near the window. So if he sits near the window, yeah. we should probably move yeah. him away from it, especially right. if he's having days where he's more sensitive than others. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think that that was great what you said to yeah. bring up like mental health. Definitely check on that. Yes, yeah. because I definitely want to give him options, you know, and I feel like just kind of approaching him, talking to him about it, just to kind of see, you know, why he's sitting in the bag. And, you know, by, based on like what he tells me, I can kind of give him some of those suggestions, you know, maybe right. we could, you know, sit you closer to the front. Maybe we can kind of, you know, help, I can help with lighting, of course. Right. Um, so, you know, it's a few little things that, you know, knickknacks we can help to increase, you know, his class participation. Awesome. Um, so just because we don't have enough time today, uh, I was going to tell you about a DIY, DIY activity to try at home or with your other teachers if you wanted to say thanks to them as well. Um, so what uh, me and a few of my other educators have done um, is we have taken goggles any kind that you want, you can go to the Dollar Tree, um, steal your kids, whatever. Uh, take them and tape them up in different ways. You can do it towards the center, you can do it toward the outside, you can do a thin layer over top. Um, just to try out what it'd be like, what it'd be like um, to have different visual deficits and then try to do like activities you ask kids to do in class but with the visual deficit and then try doing it from the front of the class and the back of the class near the window, far from the window, with contrast, without contrast, just to see what it's like to do activities with what you could call a visual impairment. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that'd be worthwhile to try out. Um, and if you like it, let me know. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. I'll try, try that out. Okay, so in summary, um, what we've learned is what albinism is. Um, what the visual deficits associated with albinism are, so photophobia, nystagmus, nearsighted and farsightedness, and then how um, we can help. So, yeah, thank you. Do you have any questions? <laughs>